questions before we get going? Yes. One last one question for you. Okay. Would you rather eat a mountain or drink a lake? Eat a mountain or drink a lake? You have infinite time in the not going to die from either one. Well, I'd rather drink a lake. Oh, I'm not going to die from either one? You're not going to die from either one. Uh, it kind of depends on what's in the mountain. You know, there could be worms. There could be all kind of gross things. In a lake, do I have to eat everything that's in the lake that I'm drinking? Yeah, I mean, if you encounter a fish, you got to put it up to its mouth. Oh, boy. I don't know. I'd probably you drink a lake. I'd probably drink a lake. Okay. You pour a little whiskey in there and make it a fun, you know, what if you put on a mountain whipped cream? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question, though. Any other questions before we get started? All right. Uh, can you all hear me on the Zoom? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Stop yelling. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, first, I don't know what the hell I'm going to talk about today. I, I know what I know what I'm going to start talking about, but I don't know how I'm going to finish. So I got a couple of routes. So I'll I'll figure it out as I go. But um, we're going to start with a brief review of where we got to last time, and then we're going to finish up that topic. So I've got up here listed some of the important sort of black hole consequences that we talked about last time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of these and just ask you to remind me of what they said. Okay? So Annabella, yeah. can you remind me what the singularity theorem said? Um, I think it's as long as everything heads towards the singularity, we'll get to a black hole. Yeah, and what mechanism did they use to prove this singularity? Exactly, yeah. So instead of using a singularity itself, which is beyond the reach of general relativity, what Penrose and Hawking demonstrated was that even before you get a singularity form, you get a trapped surface, and that trapped surface forces everything inside of it to go towards zero. So that's where you can have an asymmetric or aspherically symmetric configuration, which you might think when it collapses, things will just miss the origin. It forces everything, even if it's asymmetric, to head towards a single point. Okay, so that's the singularity theorem. I'm not going to write this stuff up there, so hopefully you're listening to what's said. Who can help me? Well, actually, it's not who, it's, it's who will. Shaylee! Yeah. Shaylee, remind me what the cosmic censorship conjecture says. Um, you have to have an event horizon in front of the singularity. That is almost correct. You just missed one minor condition. Uh, let me look at my notes real quick. That's fine. Can anybody help her out? I was at the singularity, um, the singularity result from a collapse. Yes, the singularity must result from a collapse. In that case, you're guaranteed there's going to be an event horizon hiding the singularity from the external world. The counterexample I gave, which we'll look at later, is that of the Big Bang. Okay, the Big Bang did not come from a collapse, therefore it is actually a naked singularity. Russ! Hi. Russ, can you remind me of the no-hair theorem? The no-hair theorem says that the only properties of the black hole that can be externally observed, mass is charged into a moment. Good, thank you. And last but not least, Joel. Joel, what's the area theorem? Um, so I don't remember, so I'm just going to look at your notes. <laughs> um, but instead of that, assuming the weak energy condition. Yes, good. Which means that we have a positive density. The area of an event horizon never decreases. Good, yeah. So the uh, area of the event horizon of a black hole for anything which satisfies the weak energy condition, that just means the energy density is positive. For anything that satisfies that, the area of a black hole will never decrease. Okay? So, I review, and then there's the energy momentum result, which I won't ask anybody about. But the energy momentum, it's kind of like asking what are the conserved quantities associated with a space time itself. Go, go ahead. Special question. Sure. Uh, naked singularity. Is that like. Some dude left, if you spell it N -E -K -K -I -N. Oh, that's just me being silly. It's oh. naked. 
Naked is the southern word for naked. So when I was young, people were naked. When I grew up, people became naked. But I throw it back to naked sometimes, because naked's more fun, but it just means naked. Okay. No clothing. It's got the emperor's new clothes on, you know, it's got nothing on. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. For the energy momentum, though, we want to talk about the energy and momentum associated with a geometry, a space, rather than the conserved quantity associated with a particle moving through a space. And so I said there was this, um, these Comar integrals to let us do this, but I just want to remind you of the results of this, and that is that if you're dealing with Minkowski space, then the energy associated with the space-time is actually zero. If you're dealing with the Schwarzschild geometry, for a non-rotating black hole, the energy is just the mass of the black hole. And if you're dealing with the Kerr black hole, the energy is quite surprisingly still just associated with the mass, okay? You do not get a contribution to the energy of the space time from the angular momentum. Now you do have the angular momentum as a separate conserved quantity, so it's still a relevant quantity. It just does not contribute to the energy of the system in this way, and we're gonna use that a little bit later on. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was going to ask if charge contributes to energy. Yeah, yeah, charge can contribute to energy, but we're not really carrying charge into our story today. I mean, charge is a charge is a very, um, and hopefully you'll see this on your homework, it's a very interesting sort of playground for applying ideas, but in realistic terms, charge is not that important because pretty much every, every body, every microscopic body is charge neutral. So, okay. All right, do, 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 do. All right, so then we um, took the care black hole and we, um, yeah, we, we eliminated the over extreme version of it. So there, there's the limit of the extreme version. And we discovered that there was a new feature associated with the care black hole beyond just the fact that it has two radii, the inner and the outer radius, and that is the presence of the ergosphere, okay? So remember, in the, for, as far as the r plus and the r minus radii, delta is positive, which means that the coefficient in front of r squared, the r squared of the metric is positive, which means you can move in or out. But once you get in between the inner and the outer radius, delta goes negative which means you can only move in one direction. It can be in if you're coming from the outside or it can be out if you're coming from the inside, but once you're in there, you have to move in that one direction, you can't turn around. But then once you get in here, delta goes back to being positive, which means you can move in or out, which is interesting because you can go in and see the singularity, go through the singularity, it's up to you, and then you can exit. The ergosphere plays a different role. Who would like to remind me of what role the ergosphere plays? Property. Yes. The ergosphere is the min or is the crater at which you can no longer stay stationary. Exactly. You cannot be at rest in the ergosphere. Okay. You can enter it and you can leave it, and you can leave it going to a larger radius or a smaller radius. Either one. You can do that. What you cannot do is sit inside of it at rest. And of course, what I mean at rest is not. I turn everything off and I just sit there at rest. You know, that doesn't happen. And, I mean, I can't just turn everything off and sit here at rest because this is gravitationally attractive. I'll be pulled into it. But I can certainly put, get here and turn on thrusters pointing away from the center of the black hole and balance them with the attraction of the black hole and therefore sit at rest here, okay? However, it is impossible inside of the ergosphere, okay? Again, the direction is not restricted, but Sitting at rest is impossible, yes? So let's say I'm falling into the black hole. Yes. I enter the ergosphere and then I turn on thrusters. Yes. If I slow down my speed going in, what happens at the moment where I go from going in versus going out? So you mean when your velocity is temporarily zero? Right, what would that mean? I actually don't know if you can do it on a purely radial trajectory, but you can always deflect. You can always come in like this. So that will be entry and exit without ever coming to rest. Does that make sense? But you might not be able to do it along a purely radial trajectory where you have to come to rest and then turn around and go backwards. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so now, one of the interesting observations of this, which I left off with last time and which we're going to pursue today, 
um, is the idea that in defining the energy of the system, what we discover is that if a system is external to the ergosphere, then the energy of the system is not necessarily positive. However, if a system is within the ergosphere, because this term in the energy can be negative if you're inside of the ergosphere, if this term beats this term, then you can actually have negative energy inside of the ergosphere. Which is a little weird, but you can do it. Okay. However, if you're outside of the ergosphere, you cannot have negative energy. You can only have positive energy. And this is just being mapped to the asymptotic wave Minkowski space-time. So asymptotically, your energy must be zero from above. So you, asymptotically, your energy has to diminish to zero from above. But at any rate, inside we can have the energy be positive or negative, whereas on the outside it has to be positive. Now this gives us an interesting thing to do, and that is what we can say is, and I'll finish with this and I'll just start up again with it, uh, consider a system E0, which is composed of two pieces, E1 and E2. Here, this is greater than zero, however, this is going to be greater than zero, but this is going to be less than zero. Okay? Now, this immediately tells me, of course, whoops, that E1 is greater than E0 is greater than zero. Okay, this, this bit is actually larger than this. Okay? And what we can do is we can send this thing into the ergosphere. And then by breaking it up into these two pieces, we can have this piece leave the ergosphere. But that means that, of course, this piece is trapped in the ergosphere. Because this ends up having a negative energy which cannot exist outside of the ergosphere. Okay? Now, um, think about this for a moment. What we've done to an outside observer is we've sent in some positive energy and what has come out has even more energy. So it seems like we're lowering the energy of the black hole. It should be a little bit bothersome. Okay. I mean, we're reducing the mass of the black hole, but we've got this area theorem. The area theorem, as Joel reminded us, says, you know, you can't, as long as you're satisfying the weak energy condition, you can't lower the mass, but you can't lower the area of the black hole. Yes? Would you be increasing the mass but reducing the spin? We're, we're going to, well, we're going to, so increasing the mass and decreasing the spin, or decreasing the mass and increasing the spin? Yeah, increasing the, the net mass of the black hole, but decreasing the amount of energy tied up by the spin. We're actually going to decrease both of them. So, the, but, but notice, the, the black hole's energy is getting smaller, okay? And the black hole's energy is tied to its mass. So its mass is definitely getting smaller. What happens to the angular momentum we'll talk about in just a moment, okay? But I just want you to realize, forget about the, thing, the fact that this is spinning for the moment. We're taking, a, 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 we're taking a, a probe that has a fixed amount of energy, E0, we're throwing it into the black hole and it's coming out with more energy than it went in with. Where did it get that energy? It got it from the black hole. That means the black hole is losing energy. Another way to think of it is you're just forcing the black hole to absorb some negative energy. If you have a positive energy and you throw some negative energy into it, the total energy gets smaller. Okay? Now, I want you to notice, this means that the mass of the black hole is getting smaller. We could, in principle, take that and argue, therefore, the area is getting smaller. Right? But 
that's not necessarily the case, which we'll, which we'll calculate. Okay, so first and foremost, um, to get this process to work, where you actually want the uh, larger energy to go, or the, sorry, the enough to go in and then have a larger energy come out, it turns out there's a constraint that has to be satisfied, and that is that the angular momentum of the piece J2, which has negative energy, the angular momentum of this has to be less than or equal to the energy of that thing divided by omega h, where omega h is a over r plus squared plus a squared. Hopefully you remember what a is from our definition quantities. Oh, hello. In the, uh, we're not doing a quiz today, so there's no point in having food. It's not well, I'm here for the midterm. Oh, OK. <laughs> At any rate. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, so this is the angular velocity of the horizon, basically. So you can ask, what's the angular velocity of the r plus horizon? And it's given by that expression. Um, now, notice, since E2 is negative, that means that J2 is minus omega h, or it's proportional to minus omega h. So, so J2 and omega h have opposite signs, but think about this. Omega h is talking about the spinning of the horizon. That's associated with the angular momentum of the black hole. If the horizon is spinning this way, the angular momentum is, although I don't like to do that, I just like to say the angular momentum is this way, okay? The thing you're throwing in and it's being absorbed by the black hole, however, must have the angular momentum moving in the opposite direction. <laughs> At any rate, if the black hole is spinning this way and you want this negative energy object to be absorbed by it, the negative energy object must have angular momentum in this direction, okay? So Sophia, I just got back from taking my dog pee. I don't know what's going on. Okay, no, I'm just going to ask you this question because you can answer it. If I have something which is rotating this way, and I throw something that collides with it, and that thing is rotating this way, what happens to the total rotation that you started with? Does it increase, decrease, or stay the same? It should stay the same. Absolutely not. Oh. This plus a little bit of this is equal to less, less, less of this. Yeah. Less of this. Exactly. See, these aren't hard questions. I got a hard question coming up. I think I'm going to ask him. Uh. <laughs> At any rate, okay. So now, what I want you to realize though is that. This process of diminishing the mass of the black hole is also diminishing the angular momentum of the black hole, okay? Now, first of all, we'll call J2 delta JBH because you can either think of this as the angular momentum that you're throwing in, or you can just think of it as the change in angular momentum of the black hole. It doesn't matter, it's the same thing, okay? There is clearly a limit to this process. What's the limit? Say it again. That's a good guess, though. Exactly. If, if you throw in enough angular momentum canceling off the angular momentum of the black hole, you'll bring the black hole's spinning to rest. But if the black hole's spinning is at rest, there's no ergosphere. Therefore, this can't happen. 
this process of these negative energy particles, or these negative energy states, they rely on the, the ergosphere. Okay, just, I, you might not remember the argument, but it was based on this. Once you've diminished the angular momentum sufficiently, you can't do this process any further. Now, don't get me wrong, the mass has gone down and the angular momentum has gone down, okay? That might lead you to the conclusion that the area got smaller. I mean, you've reduced the mass and the angular momentum, but we need to be careful, okay? So let's look at what's going on. So, first of all, there is an idea of what's called a Penrose process. And for a Penrose process, you're basically balancing the energy, the angular momentum, and the angular velocity of the horizon such that this is an equality. And then again, treating every property of E2 as just a change in the property of the black hole, we have that delta J is equal to delta E of the black hole divided by the angular velocity of the outer horizon of the black hole, okay? Now, let's recall R plus is gm plus the square root of g squared m squared minus a squared, where, of course, the angular momentum is just j equals ma. A was defined as the angular momentum divided by the mass of the black hole. Now, well, let's think about this. Here's the outer radius of the black hole. In doing this process, throwing in these special things where you can deposit negative energy into the black hole, but you're also decreasing the angular momentum of the black hole, A gets smaller, and so does M. What happens to R plus? Really? It's smaller. Really? Is it obvious? The answer is no, it's not. It's not obvious what happens to R plus. Okay, because there's a difference here. All right? Well, it turns out that R plus is your intuition for the area of the black hole. What's the area of a black hole? Four pi r plus three. You would think. But we have to be more careful in calculating the area. Okay? These are curved geometries. Those formulas that hold in flat space typically don't work. So we actually have to go into how do you calculate the area of something in a curved geometry. Calculate the area and ask, is the area increasing or decreasing? Okay, so let's do that. So first and foremost, the area of the horizon is essentially the integral over the determinant of an induced metric integrated over d theta and d phi, where gamma ij is an induced metric on the horizon with dr dt equals zero. Okay? Now, for now, don't worry about the square root of, del of determinant of gamma. Okay, just, just take this as my word. What you do is you find a two-dimensional metric which describes the spherical surface of the black hole. That's at a fixed point in time and at a fixed radius, and the radius happens to be R plus. You can pick any point in time you want, that doesn't matter. Once you've got that two-dimensional metric, you find the determinant of it, take the square root of it, and this is sort of the integral weight of this normal integral over d theta d phi, okay? If you do this, it's really straightforward to do this, by the way. And, and remember, the metric that you're using to find this two-dimensional submetric is what metric? Gamma. 
Yeah, it's the care metric. We're describing a spinning black hole. The care metric, I'm not even going to write on a damn board again. It's so long. <laughs> it's definitely way different than flat space, OK? But nonetheless, if you do it, what you get is that this is 4 pi times r plus squared plus a squared. OK? And where this gets valuable is if you replace r plus squared with its, with its expression here, and this becomes 8 pi g squared m squared plus 8 pi square root g to the fourth m to the fourth minus g squared m squared a squared, where remember this is j squared. Okay? Now if we vary the m and the j, so this is just a formula for the area of the horizon. Now what I want to do is I want to ask, how does the area change? What's the delta A that is associated with changing M and J? Then we get the following. Eight pi G A over omega H square root G squared delta M minus omega H delta J. Okay? Now let's break up this battle. What is the sign of this term? Assuming the positive root. The number 8 Positive or negative? Pi, capital G, A, or negative? Omega, the same sign as A. This is the spinning velocity of the horizon. This is the angular momentum. Of course, they have the same sign. So if I'm assuming the positive root, this whole term is obviously positive. What about that? Negative. Say it again. Negative. Negative? You're losing half, right? Uh, this is the angular momentum of the black hole. Oh, I thought you were putting it in parentheses. Oh, sorry, sorry. This term in parentheses. that has to be satisfied to do this at all. It makes this positive. So note, even though when you're throwing these things in, R plus gets smaller, the angular momentum gets smaller, the change in the area of the horizon is positive. The horizon's getting bigger. a non-trivial example of the area theorem. Highly non-trivial. I mean, hell, until they actually calculated this, they thought, ah, oh, this can't be true, because I can do this. Lo well, and behold, though, the calculation leads to a area of the horizon theorem support. Okay. Now, we have the area of the horizon. And in this model, the area of the horizon is a quantity which can never, ever, ever get smaller. It can get bigger, but it can never get smaller. What else in physics behaves like that? Entropy. Entropy. You guys remember entropy? Maybe a little bit. Something about entropy. Okay. Entropy can only increase. And so you might think that it is natural to associate the area of a horizon of a black hole with the entropy of the black hole. Let's flesh that out, okay? 
So, first and foremost, we have uh, uh, the Bekenstein idea. He's the one that first introduced the notion that uh, the black hole's entropy should be associated with its area. And basically, his argument goes as follows. If a black hole had no observable entropy, so let's pretend that a black hole has no entropy. Let's just assume that, okay? Then what we can do is we can take an external system with entropy S0, throw it into the black hole. Once that entropy is inside of the horizon of the black hole, the external world has no access to it whatsoever, period. Okay? What did we just do to the entropy of the external universe? We just decreased it. Now, how do we counter that? If we take a black hole and we say, oh, I can take entropy from the external part of the universe, throw it in, that is completely hidden from the external world in the black hole. I mean, you, once something is in a black hole, you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't do anything with it. It's gone. Okay? So how are we gonna balance the entropy? Yes, we have to say the black hole has entropy and this process is increasing that entropy. Now, if you think about it, this is automatically weird. Okay? Because recall the no hair theorem. If you want to completely specify a black hole, all you have to give me is its charge, its mass, and its angular momentum. There's not a lot of room in specifying three numbers for you to put entropy. Entropy is what you don't know about a system, okay? So typically in, a classical, in classical physics, what we do is we take a bunch of particles in a box, and we say, okay, if you go in and give me all of the information that I could possibly need in order to detect or to predict the future of the system. So if you gave me the position and the velocity of each and every particle, and of course I know their dynamics, maybe they're free particles or whatever, if you give me all of this, then I know the future. Boom. Right? This is called having entropy of zero. All information. However, that is not the way we usually quantify things. What we usually do is we just give you a few average properties. So for example, we might give you the, the temperature of the system and the volume of the system. These quantities by no means tell you what's going on with each and every thing. In fact, for a specific set of these macroscopic quantities, you could have a gazillion different configurations inside which match them, okay? This gulf in what is known versus unknown is entropy. If I only specify a handful of thermodynamic quantities, I might as well add entropy to the list because the entropy is non-zero. You can always make the entropy zero by measuring every single thing. It's just we don't usually do that, okay? Because systems, macroscopic systems have too damn many particles, okay? So, despite the fact that the black hole can only be described by these three quantities, somehow, mysteriously, the black hole has got to be associated with an entropy. This means that in some sense, there has to be a set of configurations internal, which we don't have access to directly. We can't count or we can't you know, specifically go in and measure where all the stuff in the black hole is, but that lack of knowledge is exactly a measure of the entropy of the black hole that we see on the outside, okay? All right. So to preserve the second law of thermodynamics, black holes must have an observable entropy. 
And you might think, oh, let's, let's, let's make the mass of the black hole the measure of its entropy. But as I proved in this example, the mass of a black hole can actually decrease. It's the area that is necessarily non-decreasing. Okay? Now, why don't you think about that for a moment? The entropy of a black hole is not tied directly to the mass of the black hole, but rather to the area of the horizon. Well, let me ask you a question. If I have a system, a classical system of particles in a box, how does the entropy tend to scale with the volume of the box? So if I take a little subset here, and I have some entropy associated with that, and then I double the size of it, how does the entropy scale? What do you think? I have a volume, a cube, within this system. It's got an entropy associated with it, and now I'm going to just double it. I'm going to make it a cube twice the size. What do you think happens to the entropy? It doubles. It doubles. The entropy in classical systems is proportional to the volume. Is the entropy of a black hole proportional to the volume? No, it's proportional, no. It's proportional to an area, the area of the horizon. So this thermodynamic connection comes with this interesting glitch. It is implying that in some sense, the entropy defined in these black holes is holographic. Okay? That is, this entropy is completely determinable by what's going on on a two-dimensional surface. But that entropy is defined in the full three spatial dimensions external to the black hole. Okay? And that is typically what we would relate to a holographic Argument, and I might or might not be able to go through a holographic argument a little bit later, but let's see if we can finish these notes for today. So I'm going slow as usual. Okay, so to quantify this idea, and I will erase things that I'm sure I need. Yeah, I'm going to erase this. Okay, so we have, from the care case, we have delta M is K over 8 pi T times delta A plus omega H delta J, okay? Where you can kind of see this from this expression just by rearranging it, where K is the square root of g squared, n squared, minus a squared, over 2dm times the quantity gm plus square root g squared, n squared, minus a squared. Okay? And this k is what we often call the surface gravity of a black hole, which is essentially how strong is the gravitational attraction right at the horizon of the black hole. Remember, the gravitational attraction at the horizon of a black hole doesn't have to be huge. Okay, you can dump tons and tons of mass into a black hole, making its horizon very, very large. The gravitational attraction at the horizon is not necessarily something that will rip you to pieces through tidal effects or anything. Getting near the singularity obviously does that. Okay? But at any rate, why did I write this up here? Well, I want you to compare it to the thermodynamic expression, dE is TdS minus T dB. Okay? Now this will allow us to make some obvious connections. First and foremost, remember we've already argued that the energy is directly related to the mass of the black hole. Okay? It might or might not be obvious, but the pressure times the change in volume is actually associated to the speed of the horizon's rotation times the change in the angular momentum. 
Which leaves us with the most intriguing one, and that is that TBS is k over 8 pi g delta a, which is what we expect because we've already associated the entropy of a black hole with the area, with its area, okay? Now, I know what you might be thinking. T equals this, right? Yes, yes? Well, not necessarily. The only thing we can get from this is that this term is equal to this term. Splitting them up is not necessarily obvious. Okay? However, there's a little fellow that came in and said, I'll figure it out. His name was Stephen Hawking. And let me show you what Stephen Hawking figured out. So what Hawking did was he said, you know, I cannot do quantum gravity. Stephen Hawking was definitely not a string theorist, because string theorists can do quantum gravity. But at any rate, Stephen Hawking cannot do quantum gravity. Now what do I mean by quantum gravity? This is taking general relativity and wrapping it in a quantum framework where the fluctuations in the space-time satisfy quantum mechanical rules. He can't do that, that's fine. What he could do is he could do quantum field theory on curved backgrounds. So this is kind of a combination of quantum mechanics, you're treating the electromagnetic, the strong, the weak nuclear interactions quantum mechanically, but the only part of the gravitational story you're putting in is the curved background, okay? So what you can do is you can use a minimal coupling procedure to take quantum field theory in flat space and turn it into quantum field theory on curved space. What will we do in the minimal coupling procedure? Anybody remember? That must be satisfied, but how do, we, how do we formulate what it should look like on curved space? Like how do we add in the ingredients of curved space to the story which is normally defined in flat space? You get a linear perturbation from flat space. You don't need to do that, actually. You replace theta with g and uh, one other thing. So yeah, <coughs> first and foremost, Flat space is built on the Minkowski metric eta mu nu. So you replace anywhere you have eta mu nu in your theory, you replace it with a, a curved metric. The other okay. one, the mass of the energy momentum tensor. Well, no, because the energy momentum tensor is present even in the theory on flat space. Everything's four dimensional here, and the energy momentum tensor is well defined. So, but you, you do have to shade a mu nu to g mu nu, where we're not finding g mu nu as an unknown. We're just saying, oh, the space is curved in this way. This is the curved metric, and you just plug it in. We're not trying to solve Einstein's equations in this situation. We're just trying to say, this is a curved geometry. Let's do quantum field theory. So you gotta replace that. What else changes? There's one more key ingredient that changes. Exactly, yeah. So you have to replace the normal partial derivative with the covariant derivative, which is built out of the normal partial derivative plus the Christoffel connections, okay? So it turns out that as long as you do these two things pretty much everywhere, there's a couple of other spots where you have to be a little bit careful, but if you pretty much do these things everywhere in a quantum field theory, you'll be doing the quantum field theory on curved space time, okay? <laughs> I'm not saying that's easy. Quantum field theory in flat space time is hard. Quantum field theory in curved space time, even harder, okay? But Hawking was able to do this. That was his profession. And he discovered something interesting. Now, what he was doing was QFT, quantum field theory, near the horizon of a black hole. I definitely don't want to go through that, 
Okay? But it turns out that there is a completely equivalent way of getting the result in flat space. So how do you think I could do quantum field theory near the curved surf near the horizon of a black hole? So just do it in this little area. What flat space calculation could I do that would give me the same result? So you're saying that the second particle goes off infinity at any state? Yep. That's a good guess, though. It's a really good guess. Anybody heard of the equivalence principle? You remember that? What does the equivalence principle state? So, well, let's not look at this, just tell me the equivalence principle in general. That you can replace any curved geometry by a little thing you put in there in a small way. That is doing what? Accelerating. Accelerating. Remember, the equivalence principle basically said you can take a lab on the surface of the Earth and do anything in it you want, or you can take the lab in deep space and accelerate it upwards with an acceleration which is equal to G equal in magnitude to G. Anything you do here is going to look exactly the same as here. Okay, so you can replace gravity with acceleration in flat space. There's no gravity gravitating things over here. Okay, so this is called the Unruh effect, and the Unruh effect is simply do quantum field theory in the frame of an observer who is constantly accelerating. Okay? So you do quantum field theory in the frame of someone who's constantly accelerating, and then you can simply use the equivalent principle to say, whatever they see is the same thing you'd see if you were in a gravitational field. Okay? Well, it turns out that an accelerating observer and I'm not really going to get into the numerics of this, but this is the Unruh effect. One of the key things about an accelerating observer is that they do not actually experience Minkowski space-time. Okay? They actually experience sort of a, a deformation of Minkowski space-time, but in particular one that is not globally defined. One of the nice things about Minkowski space-time is it's defined everywhere. But if you're an accelerating observer, you can imagine that there are things in the past which can never reach you because you're accelerating away from them. Don't worry about the details of that. But this leads to um, something that we call a Rindler spacetime. So I'm just giving you these words in case you'd like to look some of this up. So this is what's called the Rindler spacetime. The Rindler spacetime has this all metric. And it turns out that quantizing fields, which this is not a quantum field theory course, so I'm not going to say that. You might be like, oh, no, that's fine. But if you quantize fields in Minkowski space, the results are very different than if you quantize fields in Rindler space. Okay? But quantizing fields in Rindler space has the direct connection by the equivalence principle to quantizing fields in the presence of gravity. All right. Now, um, one of the key differences is actually the coordinate time. And one of the very interesting things about the role of time in this is that um, we use time to identify positive frequency modes. Okay? So we're talking about, you know, creating excitations of fields through creation and annihilation operators, and then they have these different frequencies. And the time coordinate is what you use to specify whether a mode is positive or negative, okay? Well, you've got this sort of blanket statement in Minkowski space of t equals zero. But in Rindler space time, that statement gets distorted quite significantly, all right? 
then the end result, and you're just gonna, this is the, 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 the final point of this, and again, these are calculations which are way beyond what we're gonna do. Here's the weird thing, are you ready? If an M4 space-time is a vacuum, so you look out, you see nothing. Okay? In Rittler space, this is a different space or it's the same space, you're just taking the observer and accelerating them. But if in Rindler space you do this, you see a stream of particles coming at you. Okay? Where there are energy distributions and actually associated with a temperature which is proportional to the acceleration, which is defining this situation. Now I want you to just take this for a moment. If I am standing here at rest, looking at the vacuum, I don't see shit. It's kind of boring. However, if in that same scenario with a vacuum in front of me, I start running and accelerate, I will see particles coming out of the vacuum at me. Okay? This isn't arguable. This is not doing stuff on curved space. This is doing quantum field theory on flat space, which is perfectly acceptable. You're just asking, what does it look like to an accelerating observer? But once you've got this result, that an accelerating observer in flat space sees particles moving at them with this distribution, then you use the equivalence principle to argue that an observer right outside of a black hole should see particles coming at them with a temperature associated with the equivalent acceleration or the gravitational field G, okay? Now, we'll talk about where those particles come from in just a moment, but first and foremost, what we can do is we can use the equivalence principle to essentially replace A with K and then this tells us that t is k over 2 pi. Therefore, ds is delta a over 4g. Okay? So the entropy of a black hole in four dimensions is a over 4g. It's the area of the black hole, of the black hole's event horizon, divided by 4g. So Hawking was actually able to successfully split these up specifically. All right. Now, okay, that's fine. Hawking, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. figure out how this is split up, and you make the identifications here, Hawking did a calculation, which by the equivalence principle is mapped to what you see here. We're, we're trying to find out entropy, right? We're trying to figure out. However, what we just discovered is the black hole has a non-zero temperature. which actually makes sense if you go back to here. So in this story, not only is the black hole getting an entropy, it's getting a temperature. What, what is the temperature of the black hole? 
What is that? What, what is it when something has a temperature? When you have a subsystem and it's got a temperature, it's thermal energy. Say it again? Thermal energy. It's thermal energy, but it's the output of thermal energy. So this black hole, according to this calculation, is losing energy. Now here's the, here's the very interesting component of this story. Hawking's calculations pertained to Schwarzschild black holes, not necessarily Kerr black holes with an ergosphere. So for the Schwarzschild black hole, according to this result from Hawking, who was just trying to make this disconnection, what we find is that the black hole is emitting a thermal bath of particles, okay? And we're, that's acceleration, that's not angular momentum. Where, in the case of a Schwarzschild black hole, the thermal loss of energy means the thermal loss of mass. Okay? But if you have a Schwarzschild black hole and you reduce the mass, that case is so simple, the area of the horizon gets smaller. So what Hawking discovered is that through this process, this is violated. Even though in that whole care analysis, you know, you found surprisingly that this was supported. Because even though the R plus is getting smaller and the angular momentum is getting smaller, damn it, the area of the horizon is getting bigger. Well, here you go. Here's a short cell black hole whose area is getting smaller. Except, this theorem is still true. Why? Any takers? So the Schwarzschild black hole implies no beginning. Is that right? Is that something to do with this? No, no, no. So this is, yeah, that, that, this is not like hung on the maximal extension that it requires okay. an infinite lifetime or anything. Is this a positive? Exactly. Well, it's not violated, it's just this condition, okay, so in classical general relativity, this is a super obvious assumption to make because in classical general relativity, everything has positive energy. The only place you can find negative energy is from quantum effects, which is exactly what Hawking was including in this analysis. So these emissions are associated with not satisfying the weak energy condition, which is fine if you're working with a quantum system. You expect that, okay? Now, what does this mean? Well, I mean, if you wait long enough, what's gonna happen to the black hole? It's going to shrink to zero. Now, here's a question. In realistic black holes, do you think they're ever going to shrink to zero? Why not? There is that, but there's also something else. Yes, there's accretion, OK? So there's accretion for black holes. They have stuff which is falling in. And if you actually calculate the rate of this particle emission, it sort of grows inversely with the size of the black hole. So the larger the black hole, the lower this rate of emission. So in these nice cosmological black holes, stellar black holes, 
the rate going in is much higher than the rate of stuff leaving. I mean, I'm talking about just dust. I'm not talking about black hole collisions. I'm just talking about cosmic dust. So a large black hole in actual space is not going to disappear, okay? Well, that's fine, except for two things. One, yes, in the real world, there's no issue, but we can always play in ideal land, where we can say there is a black hole in otherwise completely empty space. And then you can ask, what's the future of the black hole? And in that idealistic scenario, the future of the black hole is evaporating to nothing. It might take a while, but it will eventually go to nothing. Unless, of course, the space you're in has a boundary, like anti de Sitter space does. Because in that case, the black hole will radiate, but the radiation will reflect off the boundary and come back, and eventually you'll hit an equilibrium. It gets better. Go ahead. If we're in an, uh, an empty space, what particles are entering the black hole that would create this like radiation? No, 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 no. You don't need anything to enter the black hole to create radiation. The radi so the, a black so a black hole left in in a completely empty, otherwise empty space will undergo this radiation. This doesn't this doesn't require anything to go. I know when I talked about reducing the angular momentum of a care and the mass and all that, I was throwing things in. That's not what's happening here. What's happening here is, in pure isolation, the black hole is radiating energy. It's losing mass. It's getting smaller. Okay? So we could go to these idyllic things and pursue that. Or, since we've included quantum mechanics in the story, there's another classification of black holes we could talk about. Any guesses? The black holes arising from uh, high energy collisions or quantum tunneling? Yes, and what is the characteristic that makes those so different than the normal black holes? They're tiny. They're tiny. You can have, according to quantum mechanics, microscopic black holes. Okay? Because remember, to, to get a black hole, the only restriction is that you had to have the energy concentrated in a small enough volume or area. We didn't say that it had to be this big in order, it has to be this big in order to collapse, okay? But that's the whole interior solution thing. However, you can scale everything down as much as you like. So if you could get enough mass or energy into a small enough volume, that is guaranteed to collapse to a black hole. And given the quantum fluctuations, that can certainly happen. Now, don't get me wrong, some people get scared shitless. How many of you heard about the shutdown, I think it was at CERN? Because someone had convinced the government, I guess, that, oh my God, they're gonna make tiny black holes those tiny black holes are gonna suck everything in and they're gonna destroy the universe. And they shut the accelerator down. So it took a few theorists to write a paper saying, don't worry about that, please. <laughs> and one of their observations was the following. For a tiny black hole, the rate at which it streams out stuff is rapid. Remember I said the rate goes as one over the size? If the size is tiny, this, ex this emission rate is high. Furthermore, if you're a super tiny black hole, you're not, you're not absorbing a ton. So even though for a very large black hole, the absorption rate always beats the emission rate, for a microscopic black hole, it's exactly the other way around. The emission rate always beats the absorption rate. So even though you could produce a microscopic black hole, you're guaranteed it's going to rather quickly evaporate to nothing. Yes? How quick is rather quickly? I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I, 
I would guess. I would guess it would be on the order of the of the um, the Planck time scale, and I can't remember that in in seconds. Yeah. So you can look up the Planck time because that's the really and truthfully those are the only fundamental constants that are going to go into any result at that level. So it would evaporate at about the Planck time scale. I mean, this is unless you're putting it in a very unique situation where it's in some super dense material or something like that, but just in general. Go for it. Uh, what kind of stuff is coming out of the black hole? Is it just like a rainbow soup of particles, or is it- So, no, 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 so this, well, that's an interesting question, actually, and it was someone that confused me for a while. It turns out that, so this is a thermal emission, so it's, it's just got a temper associated with it, and so this is going to be, um, so the energies are going to be determined by the temperature through a normal distribution. But also what you're going to have is you're going to have every single particle in your fundamental theory coming out of the black hole. As we understand it, there are 27 of those. 27 different types of particles. And we will see them coming out in different ratios because they have different masses, rest energies. Okay. But we expect quarks, electrons, anti-electrons, everything coming out. Everything coming out in pairs so that you don't violate conservation principles. So there's a lot that backs up exactly the answer to what comes out, but it's a, it's a clean answer. It's not like though, you know, an electron, and a couple hours later a proton, and a couple hours later a tau on. No, no, it's, it's just a continuous stream of all of the different particles based basically on their energetics, which largely is based on their mass. And then, you know, they just have to come out in combinations that are going to be neutral for all the charges and you know all the conserved quantities. Okay? Now, there's one final ingredient to this story, which I'll end with. And I'll pose this as perhaps one of the outstanding questions for general relativity. Okay? And I'll explain why it's an outstanding question for general relativity in just a moment, but let's actually go through it. The black hole information paradox is essentially the loss of information from the external universe. Now, we said earlier, oh, if you take a piece of something and you throw it into the black hole and it goes behind the horizon, then that, the entropy of that thing is lost from the external universe. So we just said, hey, this black hole's gonna have entropy that balances what's being thrown into it. Therefore, the external universe, nothing's lost, right? Right? So follow this story. Consider two non-rotating, just to keep it simple, equal mass cows. That's a horse. Hope they find out correctly. Yo, this guy again in a minute now. Oh my god, this is real good. I'm just kidding. The cow's mo uh, not rotating, is that motionless? <laughs> Funny as shit. Oh man. Okay, I'm just gonna do this and I'm gonna move. There's no there. movement of inertia. Okay, so we got cow one. It's a unicorn. <clears throat> and then we got cow two. have equal mass. They're both cows. So let's change something. Let's make this cow male and let's make this cow female. Okay? Now what we're going to do is what I said, we can always 
do as long as we have the machinery at hand. We are going to make these cows into black holes. Black holes. Yeah, we're just going to take them and compress them down. And once they get compressed down small enough, this is going to be a black hole with radius 2g mass of cow. And this is going to be a black hole with radius 2g mass of cow. Where the mass of cow is the same in both cases, remember? OK? So here's the important observation that we started with. The information that this is male and that's female is simply, in this case, hidden behind the horizon. So yeah, you know, this is a black hole. I can't see what's in it. This is a black hole. I can't see what's in it. But I know that the fact that this one came from a male cow and this one came from a female cow, that information is hidden in the black hole. I just can't see it. But that's fine. The universe is composed of me and the black hole. So I haven't lost any information, right? Now, let's let them evaporate. Well, this one is going to evaporate with a spectrum associated with the temperature T cal. This one is going to evaporate with a spectrum associated with the temperature T cal. And given enough time in an idyllic scenario, this is obviously an idyllic scenario because these are evaporating away, this black hole disappears. And so does this one. However, the outgoing emission, which is causing them to disappear, is identical in these two cases. Now I'll ask, did we lose the information that one cow was male and one cow was female? Anyone? Sure. Yes. Because all we've got here is stuff coming out with this profile associated with this temperature. This has got the same stuff coming out associated with the same temperature profile. So as long as there was a horizon, we could have argued stuff's hidden behind the horizon, but it's there. But once the horizon's gone and the information is gone, this is a problem. So, this is one of the most outstanding problems facing general relativity, and it's still hotly pursued to find a solution. It is obviously going to require some quantum mechanical uh, avenue, all right? And, you know, what's There, there are a lot of ideas out there, okay? I can't really point to which ones are super valid, which ones are not, okay? But um, once we do figure it out, there is a solid chance that A, it's actually going to not require dealing with the singularity, okay? There's a good, I mean, this whole evaporation process is done in these calculations that aren't even playing around with the singularity. Okay. So the, what's beautiful about this is resolving this problem is probably not going to require us to go to where general relativity breaks down. That's at the singularity. But rather, something interesting is happening at the horizon, quantum mechanically, okay? And in resolving whatever is happening at the horizon quantum mechanically, hopefully we can solve the black hole information paradox, but still a good way. That's it for today.